Hello and welcome to the University of St Andrews. I'd like to extend a warm greeting to all of our alumni, students, colleagues and friends who are watching from across the globe. My name is Craig and I'm a development officer working within the areas of arts and divinity here at the university. If this is your first site talk, then thank you for joining us. Our site talks are short presentations by leading members of our academic community on subjects that we hope are of great interest. Uh, it's a little flavour of the expertise that our lucky students get to see on a daily basis. This evening's talk will be given by Dr Rory Cox. The talk will last for about 30 minutes and then Dr Cox will be happy to field your questions. If you'd like to ask a question, then they can be added to the chat bar on your screen. And can I ask that we'd rather you uh, didn't give your surname, just give your first name for data protection reasons. Um, we'll aim to wrap the event up by about 6.15 at the latest, so do please get your questions in early if you'd like to ask anything. Before we get into it, I'd just like to do a quick uh, plug for our next talks uh, in the series. We have a varied schedule of talks extending right throughout the academic year, and the next one will be presented by Dr Lawrence LaSalle from the School of Management on the 26th of April, hotly followed by Professor Graham Turnbull from the School of Physics and Astronomy on the 17th of May. You can also access the full archive of past talks on a plethora of subjects from bird migration to tackling coronavirus on our dedicated St Andrews alumni YouTube channel, where this talk will also be available over coming days. Before that though, let's get back to this evening's topic at hand and tonight's guest. Dr Rory Cox is a senior lecturer and director of impact within the School of History here at St Andrews. He's also an associate director of the Institute of Intellectual History, an international and collaborative centre for the study of intellectual history. The centre has members across the globe and is hosted right here in St Andrews. Since joining the university in 2011 as a lecturer in medieval history, Rory has held two international research fellowships. In 2016, he took up the Wallenberg Research Fellowship um, at the Stockholm Centre for the Ethics of War and Peace, that's at the University of Stockholm. And in 2017-18, he held a Humanities Collaboration Research Fellowship at the California Institute of Technology and the Huntington Library in Los Angeles. Rory is currently a Fellow of the Royal Historical Society and co-editor of the journal Global Intellectual History. He's currently working on a new book which is due out next year, so look out for it, and that will be called The Origins of Just War. As well as intellectual history, Rory is an expert on the ethics of war and the history of violence. His interests cover a broad chronological range from ancient Egyptian just war doctrine to medieval military history, debates on the use of torture and the history of terrorism. His lecture will take the audience on a whistle-stop tour of how societies have engaged with questions about war and justice over time, and how many of the fundamental challenges still remain to this day. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Rory. Thank you very much, and thank you to everyone for joining us tonight uh, to talk about the ethics of war. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'll run through quite a broad range of, of topics tonight regarding the ethics of war. Um, I'll talk briefly about how I think the ethics of war evolved. Um, then I really want to run through some of the major traditions concerning particularly the justifications of war from the ancient world up to uh, the present day. If you have any questions, I'd really look forward to, to hearing from you at the end. As I said, it's going to be very much a, a kind of a fast paced uh, tour through uh, global history. So I you know I can't really do any of these things justice in and of themselves. But I really want to give you a flavor of some of the differences, but also some of the similarities and ways that world societies have dealt with the problem of war over time. OK, so first of all, why should we be interested in the ethics of war? Well, in a way, a society's approach to warfare can give us a, a really unique insight into how it understands itself and its relationship to others. During what is arguably perhaps the most traumatic and extreme form of human interaction, and that of course is warfare. So in other words, under the sort of existential stress of war, what values do societies hold on to? And what values are jettisoned as superfluous or not useful? In contemporary affairs also, politicians still refer to ideas of just warfare in attempting to legitimate mili uh, military actions. And we've seen this obviously very recently in the Russian justification of its invasion of Ukraine 
and of course, Ukraine's justification of its defense. So this is very much a live issue. And it may seem like an obvious point, but it is worth highlighting that states and communities never claim or admit that they're waging an unjust or an unlawful or an illegitimate war. There's almost always cases that they claim that their wars are justified, that they're lawful and that they are legitimate. And this is true for the ancient world, it's true for the medieval world, and it continues to be true uh, for the modern world. So in a way, why? Why do states and rulers go to the bother? You know, why do they care? Well, what seemingly unites almost all human communities over time and space is a belief that some things are worth killing for. And on top of that is a belief that some things are also worth dying for. And I think this point about dying is, is also you know, worthy of our attention because it's often given less attention in scholarship about the ethics of war, which focus on whether it's legitimate to kill people. But you know, what rulers are doing though is they're asking for also people to give up their lives, to sacrifice themselves for a particular cause. Another commonality, uh, and hopefully my, my first slide is up and I'm sure I'll be told if, if it isn't, the, another commonality is that societies seem more inclined to glorify war than to condemn it. And you can see here a range of uh, pieces of material evidence from, from Egypt, uh, from the 13th century uh, BCE, from uh, Qin China, the Terracotta Army, from uh, Tamil Nadu in India, that Shiva doing the Dance of Destruction, from Greece, uh, from Etruscan society in Italy, and obviously the, the GI Joe there. Now these are all examples arguably of glorifications of war, statuettes, figurines, things that portray war in a, in a kind of a heroic positive frame of mind. And we have, in terms of material evidence, we have far more evidence of this kind of type of attitude to war than we do for condemnations or negative attitudes to war. So how can we actually conceptualize the moral quality of war? Well, to sort of paint in very broad strokes, there's basically three approaches we can take. Pacifism, realism or pragmatism, and what is called just war theory or just war doctrine. Pacifism basically says there is no relationship between justice and war, that these two things are mutually exclusive. So pacifism, in other words, is a moral rejection of war. Realism, on the other hand, associated with thinkers like Machiavelli or earlier Thucydides in China, the Chinese legalists, more recently thinkers like John Mearsheimer, who's, who have been in the news. Realism says that war has no moral quality. It's simply a tool for power politics. It's, 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 it's what states do to get what they want. And so again, talking about morality in war, it, it's, it's just not really relevant. It's not war isn't immoral, it just is. Just war is different because just war doctrine argues essentially that there is a relationship between justice on the one hand and war on the other. That there is a moral quality to war, that war can be morally justified. So just war really sits apart from say realism and pacifism. It also should be stressed that in terms of uh, historical societies, pacifism and realism are actually incredibly rare. We have some evidence from uh, uh, early uh, Christian for, for early Christian pacifism. Um, there's also post-Reformation religious dissenters, um, some strains of anarchism. Again, in realism, we have certain thinkers like Machiavelli, but th these these thinkers were atypical rather than typical. And so realism and pacifism, we can, we can kind of put to the side. The dominant mode of thinking about warfare and ethics in world history really is this kind of just war framework, the, the idea that war can be justified. Just a, a couple of, of quick notes about language. When scholars talk about the ethics of war and, and just war particularly, they often use these three categories, adopting Latin terminology. The first is 
Yus ad bellum. This talks about the justice or the rights to actually wage war, to go to war in the first place. The second is Yus in bello. This talks about the justice or the rights in war, in the conduct of war, in restraining the conduct of war. And then the third, a much more recent development, is Yus post bellum. This is idea about the justice or rights after war, how victors should behave, what duties they have to the defeated. Now, I should stress that these three categories are kind of anachronistic to a certain sense because very few uh, historical societies put them in such explicit terms. And actually, even though they're Latin uh, language categories, even the Romans and from most of the Middle Ages didn't talk about them in this way either. Um, they're, they're, they're more modern categories, but they're actually very useful for thinking about ethics and war about sort of dividing how people approach this question. That is, how to justify going to war, what rules or limits exist when you're actually fighting war, and how you end wars and, and, and kind of try to guarantee that war doesn't break out again. Okay, so how do I think ethics of war actually came about? Well, if we actually think about war and justice, they're arguably the two most powerful social forces that shape political communities. You know, if we discount forces of nature, then war poses the greatest existential threat to communities. It also offers a number of opportunities for expansion or for enrichment. Justice is the principle that arguably makes complex communal life possible in the first place. Communities couldn't survive if violence and robbery was completely uncontrolled. It's simply too unstable. There's the old phrase of there's honour even among thieves. So war and justice are really important social forces. But the problem, as you probably already guessed, is that by and large, concepts of justice seek to limit violence within societies. They want to create stability so a society can prosper. So what happens when you want to persuade members of your community that actually violence is a good idea, violence against others, i.e. war, that to kill and maybe to be killed is a positive idea? Essentially, what this requires is an inversion of normal morality and behavior. The, from saying, don't be violent, don't rape and pillage and steal, to saying, go and be violent, go and take that thing, go and enslave your enemy. It's turning normal social behavior on its head. And so it requires explanation and it requires legitimation. And it's that process that I understand as the ethics of war. That's really, it's that tension that, that, that societies feel in actually persuading themselves to go to war and that going to war is a good idea. Also, of course, states exist in a, in a community. And if we imagine that states all compete in a game, a kind of a geopolitical tournament for power, then they also agree that there are certain rules of the game because all the players, all the states want to win, but all the states and the players want to avoid being you know, stretched off the field and permanently eliminated from the game as well. And so they need rules. Without any rules, the game becomes too risky for the individual players. And I think this is another sort of uh, reason why laws of war and norms of behavior are created. So this is how we can think about the emergence of the ethics of war and the laws of war. As a way for rulers to persuade their people that killing and dying in war is different, to killing and dying in everyday society, and as a way for states to create certain rules of predictability in their relations with one another. Okay, so when we're actually looking for expressions of ethics of war, how far back do we need to go and where can we find them? Well, I'd argue that humanity has, has been thinking about the relationship between ethics and war for a very long time, at least. 5,000 years and arguably longer. This is the Nama palette from pre-dynastic Egypt, dated to around 3100 
BCE. And you can see here a celebration of war and a celebration of King Nama uniting the two lands of Egypt, which are symbolized by those two lions with the elongated necks. But what you can also see here is a glorification of violence and a glorification of violence committed before the gods. The hawk there is a figure of the god. The, the four standards that you can see carried on, on the right hand side are standards of the gods for each army division. And hopefully you can just see on the far right hand side two rows of decapitated prisoners with the heads in between their feet and their arms bound behind their backs. On the left hand side is a, this smiting pose. This is, a, this is a, a, a piece of iconography which is very, very uh, long lasting in Egyptian uh, temples and monuments. It's called the, the Pharaoh smiting his foe. And it appears again and again. All of this is boasting of the slaying of enemies, of smiting one's foes, of victory in war. And it's all done before the gods. It's all approved before the gods. This is justified positive violence. And in a way, it's one of the earliest expressions of political thought and the ethics of war that we have available to us. The ancient Egyptian concept of just war was very much based around their concept of ma'at. And this is the Pharaoh Seti I offering ma'at, who's in his palm here, to uh, the gods. Now, ma'at was a creative force. It represented order, it represented justice, and it represented goodness. Everything outside of Egyptian territory embodied isfet, this kind of mirror principle of destruction, chaos, disorder, wickedness. And the terrestrial struggle between Ma'at and Isfet was mirrored in the cosmic struggle between good and evil. Now, this way of thinking about war and thinking about order and justice versus disorder and wickedness produced an extremely partisan just war doctrine in ancient Egypt, which basically envisaged every Egyptian war as a justified conflict of Ma'at against Isfet. And therefore, it was ipso facto a justified conflict. And with such kind of high stakes, cosmic stakes as well as terrestrial stakes, Egyptians felt absolutely no need to restrain their conduct in war. There were no in bello norms protecting combatants or non combatants or prisoners. And actually, there are a number of records of Egyptians impaling prisoners of war. And this uh, rather gruesome hieroglyph is represents to stake or to impale, and it doesn't really leave much to the imagination. In ancient Hindu thought, we also see war being conceived as a cosmic conflict. In the Mahabharata, which is the longest poem in the world, it's about six to seven times longer than the Iliad and the Odyssey combined, and it acts kind of like a, an encyclopedia of Hindu culture. In the Mahabharata, books six to ten tell of the story of the war between the Karavas, which represent wickedness, and their cousins, the Pandavas, representing virtue. And the Mahabharata dates from about 1000 BC onwards. It's, it's, it's added to and rewritten at various stages. Part of the Mahabharata is the famous Bhagavad Gita, book six. Uh, it's one of the fundamental uh, Hindu religious texts. And the Gita starts as the Karavas and the Pandavas armies are drawn up. And this is what this uh, uh, manuscript depicts. But Arjuna, one of the Pandava leaders, and remember the Pandavas are the, are the, are the righteous ones, is suddenly struck by an ethical crisis before this battle. And he says, how can he kill people he knows and he respects? The Pandavas and the Karavas are, are cousins. He, how can he kill his family and his relations? And his companion is his chariot driver, Krishna, who is an incarnation of the god Narayana, counsels Arjuna to take heart and to fight. And Krishna says, first of all, you're a member of the warrior caste, and therefore you must and you will fight. Second of all, your enemies have immortal souls, and so they'll be reborn, even if they're slain today. And third of all, even when you fight, you shouldn't do it from a desire for power or wealth or passion, 
it's simply a, a, a passionless exercise and part of the fabric of cosmic order. It's part of what we might call fate. So there is a certain fatalistic attitude as war in the cosmic order. On the other hand, you know, the, the war against the, the, the Karavas are the Karavas are is 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 clearly meant as a as a righteous war. These are bellicose people, these are sort of wicked people, and the Pandavas are doing a good thing by fighting them. From the Mahabharata, there's also various norms of war that emerge. War should be an option of last resort. It should be properly declared. Warriors shouldn't take advantage of the disadvantaged. Categories of people, i.e. non-combatants, should not be harmed. And while these norms are apparent, we also see them being breached by both sides in the Mahabharata. In ancient China as well, from around the 1046 BCE, with the Zhu conquest of the Shang dynasty, the new rulers justified their aggression on the basis that the old uh, uh, Shang dynasty had become corrupt and that the Zhu kings were waging a war of punishment. And th this was distinct from offensive wars, Gong, which were seen as quite different. During the Warring States period, from the mid 5th century to the mid 3rd century BCE, many Chinese thinkers engaged the topic of war often from the view of good statecraft. And it's interesting to see that actually th this period is contemporaneous with classical Athens, where you have a lot of similar thoughts, actually. So the 5th century BCE Confucian philosopher uh, Mencius, or Mengji, and the 4th century BCE philosopher Shunji, and I apologize to any Chinese speakers for, for butchering the, the pronunciations, openly condemned aggressive wars. However, they also advocated that a righteous ruler was morally obligated to wage war in defense of his people out of a love of justice and to relieve the suffering of a people under a tyrannical regime. They conceived legitimate warfare as, as punitive, that a benevolent ruler could correct, um, uh, could correct through violence because of his love for justice. But they also thought of war in, in highly idealistic terms. So they asserted that righteous war should be virtually bloodless, that the oppressed people would turn against their tyrannical ruler, and those being rectified would welcome it. How realistic that is, I think, is, is debatable. They also insisted that a righteous army would act honorably and not engage in atrocities during conflict, that prisoners of war should be released unharmed um, after the conflict had ended. In the third century BC Annals of Lu Bei Vai, which is probably the first text to apply a specific label to the concept of righteous arms, the label is Yi Bing, the, uh, the Annals insist that a righteous army would never attack non-combatants. Taoist and Moist thought also stressed that wars should be defensive rather than aggressive, and that they should always be a last resort. The Moji and, and the other Moists believe that wars arose out of a lack of proper love for others. Ideas of righteousness are also evident in the so-called seven military classics, the most famous of which is Sun Tzu's Art of Warfare, although incidentally Sun Tzu actually has the least to say about ethical questions. But in one of the other seven military classics, the Sima Fa from the fourth century BCE, we have this clear statement about war being designed to uphold moral order. If one must kill men to give peace to the people, then killing is permissible. If one must attack a state out of love for their people, then attacking is permissible. If one must stop war with war, although it is war, it is permissible. In Islam, the Quran, the Haditha, which are the sayings of the Prophet, and the numerous Sharia legal commentaries provide ethical and legal permissions for war, whilst also imposing limitations. Medieval Islamic theory divided the world between the Dar al-Islam, the house of peace, and the Dar al-Harb, the house of war. 
the concept of jihad, which is striving in the path of God, was divided itself between the greater and the lesser jihad. The greater jihad was a spiritual striving. The lesser jihad was a physical striving. And the lesser jihad is what is, is associated with warfare, striving to expand the Dar al-Islam, creating greater peace. And of course, you can see here that it's bestowing a virtuous dimension to war. This is also apparent in the concept of martyrdom within jihad, whereby the just warrior earned a place in paradise as a result of his sacrifice. And this development was echoed in the Christian concept of martyrdom in holy war, which was developed increasingly after the success of the First Crusade in 1099. But from as early as the ninth century, classical Islamic law had developed a range of legal protections in war, especially protections for non-combatants, that in many cases went considerably beyond anything in the medieval Christian tradition. And it really should be stressed that contemporary strains of radical Salafi jihadism is very, very far removed from dominant Islamic schools of thought regarding the resort to war, and especially the conduct of war. The complete abandonment of Yusin Bello principles by Al-Qaeda or by Daesh slash ISIS, um, evident in things like Osama bin Laden's declaration of jihad against Jews and Crusaders from 1998, which essentially demanded that all Muslims had an obligation to attack um, Americans and other Westerners where, uh, wherever they were found, including civilians. This is a total aberration of traditional Islamic doctrines of jihad. The Western just war tradition is usually taken to have its roots in the Greco-Roman world. Certain rules of engagement and periods of truce were developed in ancient Greece from the 8th century onwards. The Romans especially conceived of war as a legal enterprise designed to avenge injuries or restore property. And as a legal enterprise, war was very much a state activity, not a private one. And Roman writers like Cicero were very clear that only soldiers who were representatives of the state were permitted to fight. But when the Roman Empire became a Christian state in the fourth century, Christian apologists found themselves having to amalgamate Roman legalism and militarism with Judeo-Christian theology. Now, from the perspective of the Hebrew Bible, which became the Old Testament within the Christian Bible, this was reasonably easy. The Hebrew Bible is full of wars directly commanded by God and is full of war leaders. And so that was that was pretty straightforward. The New Testament, however, was far more challenging than you know, the, the, the message of the of New Testament is peace and charity, turning the other cheek and showing self-sacrifice. So how could these things be integrated and made to work? St. Augustine, who's one of the major early church fathers and a very influential voice, argued that violence, and I should stress that this is the, uh, the, the portrait on the, on the left, this is actually the earliest portrait of Augustine um, from uh, the early sixth century. Um, St. Augustine argued that violence was essentially morally neutral. The moral quality of war was determined by the temperament of those who wielded the sword. A just warrior should not fight for himself, but for a love of justice, to defend the innocent, to uphold God's law, and to prevent the sinful from sinning further, even if it meant killing them. This was, this was a kind of, you were doing them a favor by killing them, they couldn't keep on sinning. So rather than an act of hatred or violence, war in defense of justice became an act of charity and love. So in other words, Augustine divorced action from intention. A just warrior could kill with the hand as long as he loved in his heart. So it was literally an act of charity by killing somebody, but more an act of charity 
for the innocence that you are protecting, for the state that you are protecting, for the faith that you are protecting. Augustine's thought on war was gathered and systematized by the canon lawyer Gratian in the mid 12th century. And this is a page, a folio from uh, his great law book, the Decretum Gratiani, which was finished around 1140 and became one of the most influential medieval texts on law full stop, but also on the ethics of war. The discussion of just war was also elaborated by many other medieval scholars, perhaps no, most notably by Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, who reconfirmed that for a war to be just, it had to fulfill three conditions. Just cause, things like self-defense, defense of justice, defense of rights, proper authority, this had to be a public authority, not a private individual, and correct intention, i.e. that you're not going to war for venality or hatred or lust, but rather that you're going to war for love of justice, love of others, self-sacrifice. Aquinas also interestingly touched on the concept of double effect, something that actually has become more relevant to modern warfare over time. Now, double effect recognizes that some acts have, and I should say that's acts, not acts, act as in axes. <laughs> Double effect recognizes that some acts have more than one effect. It argues that if a virtuous act results in secondary, perhaps unforeseen, negative consequences, then the original action is still permissible. And as you can probably see, this is basically the argument for justifying, in a modern context, collateral damage, or in less sterile language, the killing of innocents. Basically says that if your intention is to say, destroy a military bunker, but by destroying that military bunker, you also destroy that block of flats next to it, then it's still a permissible action. That is the essentially the, the, the principle of double effect. And it has been used quite arguably quite damagingly in modern warfare. It wasn't until the 16th and the 17th century that the prioritization of Christian law and then natural law gradually fell away to be replaced by normative frameworks based on the jus gentium, the law of nations. As it became more and more obvious that rulers of independent states would always justify their own wars, would always claim to have just cause. Jurists increasingly looked to limiting actions in war rather than arguing about whether or not a state had a right to wage war in the first place. So in other words, there was a focus on jus in bello over jus ad bellum. The most influential voice was Hugo Grotius's on the law of war and peace. And this is a, the frontispage from the first edition of that from 1625, the De Iuri Belli Pacis, in three books. Essentially, Grotius recognized the autonomy of sovereign states to define their own interests and to wage war for their own benefits. However, Grotius wasn't advocating a total free for all. As members of a community of nation states, he underlined the importance of upholding long held customary norms of behavior. These are the laws of nations. He also stressed the importance of honoring contracts between parties and that these contracts should be binding on both states and their subjects. In effect, this recognition of state sovereignty and the importance of the law of nations really underpins man, much of modern international law. It's the basis of Article 51 of the UN Charter, which states the right of self-defense possessed by every nation state. The modern sort of just war doctrine, which informs the laws of armed conflict, are also really grounded in this. And, puts, and, and, these, and these ideas put a much greater stress on questions such as proportionality in war. In other words, is your response proportional to the initial injury? The likelihood of success, can you actually win a war? If not, should you be going to war in the first place? Risk of escalation, and again, this also links back to ideas of proportionality. And as we've already mentioned, collateral damage. 
what are the risks to civilians. All of these ideas have deep roots in the early modern period and in the medieval period and arguably even earlier, but they've become more and more prominent over time. Importantly, the majority of modern just war doctrine and international law assumes something called the equality of combatants. This effectively separates ad bellum claims, claims about the right to go to war or injustice to go to war, from in bello protections limitations within war and conduct. Essentially, the equality of combatants claims that regardless of the justice of one's side, every combatant and non-combatant deserves the same protections. So it doesn't matter if you're fighting for quote unquote an unjust side, you as a combatant or a non-combatant still can expect certain protections when fighting war, such as not to be summarily executed as a prisoner of war, for example. Over the last two decades, a group of revisionist just war theorists, mainly analytical philosophers, have challenged this notion. And they challenge it because they argue that war shouldn't be treated as a separate moral category, which it usually is. They argue that actions in war should be treated in the same way as actions in peacetime. So that the soldier fighting an unjust war is guilty of numerous crimes and is therefore liable to a range of harms that the just soldier is not liable to. Now, controversially, some revisionist scholars have even argued that this applies to unjust civilians as well as unjust soldiers. And say a real world example of this would be if just warriors had taken a group of unjust warriors prisoner and were threatened by a, a say a counterattack, they could justifiably execute the unjust prisoners in order to ensure their own safety. Because as just warriors, they are innocent and they shouldn't be in war at the first place. So all the blame is on the unjust side. So it, it, it creates a lot of um, problems within the assumptions of the laws of armed conflict. Another problem, of course, is that who decides which side is just or unjust? Without a universal arbiter of justice, this remains a pretty sort of uh, inscrutable problem. There's also serious issues about how we assess the guilt of individual soldiers. Does an unjust soldier know they're fighting an unjust war? We all appreciate the power of propaganda, for example. Were they pressed into service? Were their families threatened? In other words, how much choice did they have in going to war? These are all significant challenges. A final recent development is the doctrine of the responsibility to protect, often referred to as R2P. Now, the responsibility to protect, or R2P, is an international norm, not a law. It was adopted in 2005 at the UN World Summit and was really created in the wake of the Rwandan and Balkan wars of the 1990s. It focuses on four key objectives, the prevention of genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity. And really it justifies forms of humanitarian intervention, including military intervention. However, we've also seen how just war language can be manipulated. The American and British invasion of Iraq in 2003 was justified on what we now know were spurious claims. So too Russia's current invasion of Ukraine. Yet anyone who's followed Putin's language has seen that he's mobilized the language of just war and international law. He cited the right of self-defense as enshrined in Article 51 of the UN Charter accusing the West of turning Ukraine into a hostile anti-Russia on our own historical territories. He's claimed that his war is not a war, but a special operation. And he's basically uh, uh, described it as a, as a R2P action, as a humanitarian intervention to defend genocide or the risk of genocide against Russian speakers in Crimea and the Donbass. So he's used all the languages of just war and international law to, just, to, to justify a war which most of the world 
uh, believes is unjust. Okay, so what, where does this leave us? Where, what's the conclusion to all of this? Well, I would argue that com communities, both historical and contemporary, really require and believe in the concept of justice, whether that's religious or, or secular, um, and, and, and the morality that it embodies. It's also a truism that political com communities and combatants believe that their wars are just or want to believe that their wars are just. And so we can't simply dismiss ideas about justice and ethics and morality as mirages of power or economic relations. That doesn't, really that doesn't uh, explain them satisfactorily. I'd also argue that theories of just war fulfill a certain existential requirement of complex political communities. It's a need for individuals to believe in the essential virtue of their community and of themselves. And like I said, where does this where does this leave us? Well, in some ways, it's it leaves us with rather bleak conclusions that you know that that we see claims to justice, claims to ethics, but that they're manipulated and directed in various ways. On the other hand, there's an encouraging observation from global history. It's a realization that over time and space, societies have a great deal in common concerning their thought about war and their desire to restrain it in various ways. And actually the evidence for truly unlimited warfare is very sparse. Most communities are well aware of the potential horrors of war, not only for the victims, but also for the victors, and have spent considerable time and energy in thinking about how to constrain the human propensity for extreme violence and brutality. And amid, a, as I said, a generally quite bleak field of research, perhaps this is a, a flickering light of hope. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, like, like I said, I'd be delighted to, to, to talk to you with your questions. Uh, thanks, Rory, for a, a fantastic talk. That's been a genuinely enlightening and interesting, uh, both historically and uh, in light of uh, current events, which I know you touched on a bit there. Um, that's been evident in some of the questions that are coming through as well. And I'd urge people if they've still got questions to get them through to us so that we can uh, ask those before before quarter past six. Um, I'll, I've got a couple of questions myself that I was thinking of when you were you were talking. I wonder if you could say a little bit about um, what the realists have to say about war. Yeah, so realism is uh, essentially this idea that that states exist in an anarchic uh, community and that n no state can really truly trust the other and war therefore is a, is a tool of statecraft it's not a, a, a moral tool it's not an immoral tool it's simply a tool and it's about power and and surviving within that anarchic society now realist thought can be traced or is is traced back to say greek writers like thucydides um, also associated with writers like Machiavelli in the, in the Italian Renaissance, um, and more recently by um, writers like John Mearsheimer. Now, John Mearsheimer has come into uh, quite a lot of criticism recently because of a, a talk he gave several years ago, which essentially said that the expansion of NATO eastwards would provoke Russian aggression. And this has been taken as him kind of justifying the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But that's, that, that's unfair, I think. All that he's done is interpreted, interpreted Western uh, political action according to his structure of, of power politics. Now, the way that the realists think about war is essentially that war is, is a pragmatic tool, um, and and that it's 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 a it's a tool which both has positive and negative consequences for for all of the actors involved. But effectively, it's the, it's the fear and the suspicion of other actors within the international sphere that provokes states to arm themselves. And the more a state arms itself, the more its competitors will feel the need to arm itself until eventually something sparks and war uh, breaks out. But it, this kind of pragmatic streak behind realist thought, though, that there it's also evident to a certain degree in just war thinking. Uh, there isn't there is a certain pragmatism within just war thinking. But realism is, is a really influential doctrine in international relations theory in the 20th century and the 21st century. 
And I, I, I do think it has some valid things to, to say. But interestingly, the Chinese legalists also thought of war in this way. They thought of war purely as a tool of statecraft. Um, so that's another source for early kind of realist thought. Mm. Thanks. That, um, when you were speaking there about the, essentially the kind of arms race, that brought to mind this question that's coming from uh, Nicole, who asks him, um, do you believe it's possible to shift the global agenda from war to peace? And I guess you mentioned pacifism at the start as well. And that made me wonder, you know, why hasn't pacifism been more prominent in, uh, in human history? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I'll, I'll tackle the first thing. I think the reason why pacifism hasn't been more um, dominant is that most people's instincts are not pacifistic. Uh, most people would say that if you are attacked, then you have a right to defend yourself. You know, if you take pacifism to its real logical limit, it requires a huge degree of bravery and moral uh, courage and moral certitude to actually stand by and watch the things that you love and care about get taken away from you potentially. Now there are various arguments to say that if everyone was pacifist then it would shame aggressors and that eventually they'd have this kind of domino effect. Unfortunately you know human history hasn't really proven that correct and that actually people who are willing to use violence and power have used violence and power um, and, and been quite successful at it. In terms of is it possible to shift the global agenda from, from war to peace? Yeah, of course it's possible. Yeah, I absolutely believe it's possible. Whether, but it's incredibly difficult. We, you know, every time we think we're getting closer to a period where we can say this is the end of war, things kind of crop up unexpectedly. And while it, you know, war is a way to unite communities, it's, it's a danger to communities, but it's also a classic way to unite them. You know, there's nothing better than an external foe if you're having domestic problems. And actually, there's a great quote from Aristotle, who's obviously writing in the fourth century BCE in his book on politics. And he says that communities have to be wary of peace. And he says that actually you should invent distant dangers because that actually creates cohesion at home. So you might also you could even argue that war, you know, serves purposes beyond just say expansion or enrichment and that it actually helps bind communities. Now the one uh, I guess the way to do that is to make war so prohibitively expensive both in economic terms, social prestige, international you know um, interaction, so on and so forth that it, it's the, it's its positives simply are outweighed by its negatives. But arguably, you know, the war in Ukraine belies that because one would argue that Russia is, is experiencing far more negatives than positives from this war, and yet it still went to war. So I think it's incredibly difficult, but I, I don't think we're, it's absolutely hopeless. Yeah, that last point's interesting because I was, I was thinking while you were speaking about, um, you said something along the lines of without any rules, the game becomes risky. I just wondered, you know, how do, as rules kind of break down in war, how do states decide what level of risk or what level of injury is acceptable? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it's always going to be, uh, it's, it's just, it's a difficult one to, to answer because it's, it's, it's always dependent on the next war. It's always difficult to predict, um, sorry, it's always difficult to predict. On the whole, though, states want to, and, and any community wants to ensure its own survival. And most wars don't lead to the complete extermination of either side. So there's an assumption that even at the end of a war, one side or the other will exist in some form, and both sides will probably exist in some form, although one side perhaps you know, um, bowed and, and subservient to, uh, to the victor. But there's the assumption that you might also be in that position yourself one day and and you know it's a bit like the the kantian uh, golden imperative you know how how would you act if all things were equal and so rules are there almost you might say as an insurance policy that if you're on the losing side then you still guarantee yourself some degree of um um ex you know longevity and, and some degree of survivability um, but yes, I mean, it's, 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 
the problem about war is that it, it remains unpredictable and I think it will always remain unpredictable and the, the problem about escalation is a real one we can never really predict how a war will spiral out of control or will head in directions that people simply don't expect it to and that's why it remains such an incredibly dangerous endeavor yeah as i think it's been borne out by by current events um there was also a quote that he said from the seam of fire that was if if one must attack a state out of love for their people then that attack is permissible i just wondered if there was a kind of real world example that you could give of where that that might be the case because there's a you know given current events as we're talking about that could seem pretty hollow in a lot of, of cases but i wonder if there's anyone has I use that justification in a kind of meaningful way. Um, you, you mean attacking other people in terms of an intervention? Yeah, I think so. I think, well, the, the, the quote was, if, if one must attack a state out of love for their people, then attacking is permissible. Yeah. Um, I suppose that could be seen as an intervention, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly how it was it was posited in, in the Chinese literature that, yeah, effectively, you would um, uh, unseat a tyrannical regime. Okay. because you are the defender of righteousness um, and and therefore you were literally doing it out of a love for the common people. Now actually in, in reality this is often a way for one state to, to justify its um, conquest of another state by saying that oh that, that regime is corrupt and needs to be replaced. But no I mean essentially that is the principle for humanitarian intervention isn't it? They're, they're saying that you are forcibly going to go into another country to defend the people um, from whether it's ethnic cleansing or, or genocide. Now, I think there are arguments to be made in favour of that. Um, unfortunately, once again, we go back to this problem of what are the consequences that are unpredictable? And we've seen in, in a variety of particularly Western interventions over the last 20 to 30 years, that once you make the commitment of going in with arms, and not you know, war is always destructive. You'll always kill innocent people. Will you do more harm than good? And I think that remains the, the fundamental question of whether war does more harm than good. And I think in most cases it probably does it probably does more harm than good, even if it's quote unquote for good reasons. Thanks. Um I had a question from uh, Marshall, which is uh quite long, but I'll read it out for you. It's um, Given the general shift in global opinion from the latter half of the 20th century into the 21st, that war is no longer an appropriate way to resolve disputes between states and in light of the backlash against Putin's actions in Ukraine, do you think the prevalence of war will continue to diminish in the future or do you think war will merely adapt and remain a staple of human experience? Great question. Thanks, Marshall. Um, well, there's, there's two elements to that. War has, you know, the 20th century and the 21st century has both seen a huge amount of war, um, even post Second World War. And I think we need to be careful about thinking that war doesn't exist. And in, 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 in the West versus war not existing full stop. You know, a lot of what we saw in the latter half of the 20th century was the export of warfare to parts of the country that westernized or industrialized countries weren't that bothered about. So in other words, proxy wars, whether that's in Central America, South America, whether that's in Southeast Asia, whether that's in Central um, Africa or Western and Eastern Africa as well, um, whether that's in Central Asia. You know, there, there, there were lots and lots of wars in the late 20th century and early 21st century, and there continue to be. So I think we need to be a little bit careful about congratulating ourselves that we've eliminated warfare because actually we we haven't and and, um, and most Western countries have been involved in some wars to some degree um, for most of this time. It just hasn't been on American soil or French soil or British soil or Australian soil. Um, equally hasn't been you know on, on Chinese or Russian soil as well but the, these countries have exported their wars in, in the same way. Um, in terms of its prevalence, you know, one of the major factors that we thought was defending us against major war was, was nuclear arms. The, 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 the risk of war was so great 
that you know mutual guaranteed destruct destruction was was a way to prevent major wars breaking out. I think there is some truth in that, and that's essentially one of the arguments of offensive realism. Um, uh, sorry, uh, defensive realism. Sorry, um, but again, where where is the where's the evidence? You know, the twenty first century has seen a lot of warfare. Um, so until until that is solved, and until you know the, the arms industry is curtailed, and until states stop seeing it in their interest to destabilize other states, then I think we will have war. We may not have world wars, but I think we'll have war still. Yeah. Um, just to follow on for that, we've had quite a, a lengthy question in from uh, Adam, but I'm going to just read out the, the last part, which um, I think is Quite interesting. It'd be, it says it'd be interesting to learn more about the arguments that totalitarian states typically employ. Um, if you have any kind of additional comments on that for how totalitarian states would, would justify a war to, to their populace. Yeah, great question. Uh, the answer is in, in very similar ways. Um, you know, totalitarian states are actually usually masters of propaganda, and it's one of the ways that they retain power. Um, over long periods of time is that they control all forms of media um, and controlling narrative about war is absolutely fundamental. Now and and they you know depending on where in the world you, you find these sorts of states um, they're perfectly capable of you know tapping into the, the the cultural language of that particular part of the world. I mean hopefully as it became clear in the presentation there's lots of similarities in, in justifications for war. You know, they, uh, many of them talk about ideas of just cause, you know, why you go to war in the first place, to defend the innocent, out of love of justice, out of love of God or whatever it may be. They also talk about um, proper action in war. And, and that's really, you know, striking, you know, whether it's kind of 3000 BC Egypt or whether it's you know, 20th century um, America or, or the West or international law, there's, there's lots of commonalities. So totalitarian states use exactly that same sort of language. They, they use the language of us and the other. They use the language of righteousness and defending traditional principles and a way of life. And they use the language of, of justice. Increasingly as well, you know, with, with as, as totalitarianism is, is wont to do, it, it kind of veers towards extremes. So you have often the depersonalization or dehumanization of the enemy, talking about them in terms of barbarians, you know, savages. On the other hand, of course, we've had similar language deployed in the war against terror. You know, terrorists are seen as, as the new barbarians of our age. Um, Non-state actors are not accorded prisoner of war status and are kept in places like Guantanamo Bay with no rights and no trial and and, and nothing else. So, you know, it's not just totalitarian states that can slide down this slippery moral slope, um, but effectively they, 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 they marshal exactly the same sort of arguments that we see elsewhere. Thanks. Um, I think we've probably just got time for one more, so I'm going to uh, shift the focus slightly onto the academic process. Uh, Jacob's asked a really interesting question where he says, thanks for a wonderful lecture, Rory. Uh, you've covered an incredible amount of ground in your talk, both in terms of geography and time. What are the challenges that come with this broad approach? Finding the time. <laughs> no, uh, that, that's, that's far too glib. I, I think the one thing I rely on, um, you know, obviously I don't speak Chinese. I haven't mastered uh, Arabic. I haven't mastered um, reading a a Egyptian hieroglyphs even. So what I am dependent on for this sort of research is the work of others essentially and, and particularly the, the translation of primary sources, which is so, so important. Um, and fortunately is, is, is gathering pace, particularly in the Chinese scholarship is more available for Anglophone readers or, or if you have French or German. Um, so that that is really crucial. It's, it's having access to to sources that have been translated, um, and you know that's you know, the comparative ethics or comparative history always requires those kind of broad brush approaches, and inevitably you probably do you know lose perhaps some of the nuance, particularly reading in the original language. But I think the benefits of being able to do these broad comparisons 
outweigh the potential um, pitfalls of it. But essentially, yeah, there's, there's no real easy solution. It's just a case of reading as much and, and as often as you can. But it is, it is very much dependent on things like translation, um, which, which would really be impossible to do otherwise. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Rory. Um, I think we'll need to wrap it up there for time reasons, but um, it just sort of it forced me to say thanks again, Rory. That's profusely thank you for, for taking the time to talk to us on this subject this evening. It's, it's always really great to get these insights into the kind of research and passions of academics. So it's it's much appreciated that you've you've taken the time to come and speak to us this evening. Um, I'll remind everyone that you've got a, a book coming out next year, which is called Origins of Just War. So people should be be looking out for that. But yeah, thanks again for your time. And um, I, sh I should say as well, thanks also to all of the staff who have given their time to make arrangements for this event. And uh, there's a lot of work that goes into it and it's it's um, it's very much appreciated by all of us. Uh, finally, a big thank you to you, our esteemed alumni, students and staff and friends for uh, attending the talk. We're delighted to be able to welcome you back to St Andrews every few weeks. So please continue to attend these events. And as I said, our next talk is on the 26th of April. And that will be Dr Lawrence LaSalle from the School of Management. But uh, other than that, it's uh, just a final thank you for you uh, taking the time to come and join us and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>